Hi, book club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 112, and we are reading Vain Glorious, I Can't Find My Copy, by Sandy Mitchell. (laughs) By Sandy Mitchell. The book is about the continuing exploits of Caiaphas Cain that take place before the very last book, but not... Chronologically, it makes sense. (laughs) It's a little weird. Uh, We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Vox channel. Spoiler warning, if you haven't yet read this book, fix the problem, and then come back and check out this episode, as we'll be discussing it from start to finish in great detail. With that, let's dive in. As always, Carrie, did you like the book? Of course I did. It's Caiaphas (laughs) Cain. It's kind of a... It was kind of a foregone conclusion, wasn't it? That we were going to at least enjoy the book. Let me ask you this. So l- l- let's spice this up a little bit. Did you love the book? Mm. It's not my favorite Caiaphas Cain book, if that's what you're asking. I think right now my favorite Caiaphas Cain book, because I have smashed them all in the last month, listened to every single one of them. It probably goes uh, Cain's Last Stand, which is the story that takes place in his retirement. Awesome, awesome book. Then Emperor's Finest, his first book, followed by Caves of Ice. Oh, man. I, God, I would have to pull up the list of his books to think on my favorites. I don't even know. I don't know off the top of my head if I could rank my favorites, but this is... Yeah, the the greater good, I think, not is, it. I think greater good's near the bottom and choose, choose your enemies which was the last book about the eldar it was kind of funny that it was about the eldar but same time there were still the nids because always it's always nids always nids and uh because he's on the eastern french so it just kind of kind of makes sense but um totally does you know honestly that middle trilogy is probably some of the that is that definitely goes after uh caves of icy the traitor's hands in there i really like the traitor's hand um the last trilogy i was just kind of okay on to be totally honest yeah it was man oh caves of ice is a really fun one i don't know i'd really have to think about it on which one is my i don't know that i could i don't know that off the top of my head i was i was not prepared for the assignment um, but this was definitely mid for me in terms of Caiaphas Kane. still mm-hmm. very enjoyable. I kind of relate one of the reasons that my variable line, um, I kind of relate Caiaphas Kane to just a really like your favorite fast food meal. It's satisfying. It's comforting. You'll love it. It, it, it hits the spot, but you wouldn't call it fine dining. Right. Some of his books are fine dining and I absolutely love them and will defend them heartily. And that being like good literature. Right. I said the wrong but, um, I, admit, I said hmm? Emperor's Finest. What I meant was for the Emperor. For the Emperor. Yeah. The first one. Yep. I um, That one is excellent. Um, it's always funny. It's. And again, much like fast food. Right. Or like I'd actually compare it a little bit to Starbucks. Bear with me. Um. If you go into a Starbucks in any country in the world, you pretty much know what the menu is going to be. Yes, they're going to have some localized favorites and mm-hmm. stuff like that, but you you know what you're going to get, right? Um, going into any Caiaphas Cain novel, you know what you're going to get, and it satisfies. But this one was just kind of like, okay, it was satisfying, it was good, but meh, didn't blow my skirt up. You know, I have to say, I kind of like drinking tea out of these little bowls. So one day, when my husband first started reading Caiaphas Cain, this was like before my daughter was born, um, I walk into the kitchen one day, and he's holding a rice bowl, and he's sipping water from it, going, huh, this is rather refreshing. Oh my god. And then, of course, I read Caiaphas Cain, I started reading them, and I was like, yeah, oh my god. Anyways. Because this is going to be the lightning round and most fun. What part stood out to you? Oh, shit. Well, okay. So, the part that even made my husband laugh was, like, early on in the beginning when there is a, um, his transport ship to the, to the, uh, oh, my 
God, the Lord General's uh, flagship, when it gets kind of hijacked and they're about to crash and everything. And they're like, you know, it was probably, it was done on purpose, but it, you might not have been the target. And his response was, if I ever do meet my end at the hands of the emperor's enemies, I'd like to at least know they meant it rather than considering me nothing more than collateral damage. Sean laughed yes. so hard at that. Um, oh, my God. Like, honestly, anything Jurgen, his how he prepared he was with stuff, just pulling stuff out. It's like, you know, he'd ask him, you know, like, can you drive this? And he's like, of course, sir. Like, it's the dumbest thing he'd ever been asked. Um, my, the line that I think, spoiler alert, is going to end up in the book club of the year <laughs> uh, awards was uh, one of Amberly's footnotes where she says, most space Marines' ability to recognize signs of heresy is limited to sticking their heads up oh to God. see where the bolter rounds are coming from. Even and my, then, my kids and I think her other that one. Oh I think God. one of her lines is like, which to be fair, is really all they need. <laughs> the other one I thought when you were about to say Amberly's footnote was when he's like, if you can't trust the Adeptes Astartes, who can you trust? And she just writes, ha! <laughs> I that and I will say so one of the things I like okay I think I've already said that one of my favorite modern science fiction movies because I'm really weird on time travel but one of my modern time travel science fiction movies I really like is Looper and one of the reasons I like it is that there's this conversation in the middle of the movie where Joseph Gordon Levitt's character is talking to Bruce Willis and he's just like but how does all this work and Bruce Willis Talking to Joseph Gordon-Levitt, but clearly talking to the audience is like, it's all really complicated. Try not to worry about it. In the very beginning, when Amberly is like, you're probably wondering why you had never heard this story before. And so too was I, actually. I love that that's basically Sandy Mitchell saying, don't ask me why this is, why I'm writing this in the place that I am. Just go with it. <laughs> like, you know what? If it's good enough for the Inquisitor, it's good enough for me. Well, I mean... None of his books are really in order. True, true. They all kind of bounce they're, they're, around. But I mean, it, it took book seven before we finally got the story of the Reclaimers, which he'd referred to them true. like for six books. And we finally knew how he lost his fingers. It was it was it was in, it was in, in that book. And it was uh, book six that had his retirement. Kane's last stand. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, 7, 8, 9, and 10 all took place way before that. It's just interesting. This one takes place like just like before his retirement. And yet, looks like we're going to get another one, which makes me so happy. I think, I think the reason they felt the need to say it, and we're going to talk a lot about this when we talk about Anzabal in general, but um, this book really peels back the truth about the Necrons. So then it does feel a little weird in some of the other books where it's just like, oh, they're mindless automatons and whatever. Um, now, to be fair, that's pretty much what he had only seen. So I do right. like and that she pretty much right, acknowledges. This is right before his retirement, right? So although through that time, he would not he would not have known anything else. Correct. And so, but I, I just... <laughs> I like when an author, and I'll be really honest with you right now, only Sandy Mitchell could have pulled this off. To be like, I also found it kind of strange. <laughs> Don't ask. Just go with it. Only he could have pulled that off and have me be like, oh, yes. And it probably because it has the seal of the Inquisition on it. Right. Let's, um, let's talk about that. Kaiba's Kate is back. Kind of. Um. Why add this new Kane story? Why add it at this point in the timeline? Like, why though? Why not? We could all use I some more laughs. Of it that way. <laughs> we could all, I mean, honestly, I, it's pretty obvious that we were, you know, when he when he released Choose Your Enemies a few years ago, we've seen the Kanes come in threes. There's no way they're going to have this solo book and then a second book. So when the when this book was announced, like, oh, we're definitely having another trilogy, and we. Definitely, definitely are. Honestly, with as long as Caiaphas Kane was in service, because he talks about how he was in service for nearly 200 years, mm -hmm. we have all kinds of stories to tell. They make so many references in this book and in Choose Your Enemies and in um, even the ninth book that they've never discussed. All this right. stuff. So he's got so many adventures. And of course, I wish more of them were with the 597th, just because I really 
really enjoy uh, Castine and Brooklaw, and um, I really love the writings of Janet Sula just because it cracks me up. And it's always those books that she, um, Amberly Vale includes, you know, from, from, in, it's like from interesting places and tedious people, <laughs> that book. <laughs> oh, yes. So honestly, I love all of the books that she references, everything, especially when it's like, you know, paragraph 5021. <laughs> she reminds me of like, like she has a paralegal in her head. Right. Just like so back then. So funny thing about Caiaphas Kane. Now, obviously, he has Sandy Mitchell has slowed down his cadence of publishing. However, years ago, I saw this interview with Weird Al Yankovic. And he said that every time a new album comes out, he's like, people are like, oh, my God, where have you been? And he's like, I released my last album like four or five years ago. I, I, like, I tend to release an album like every three to five years. Like, what are you talking about? Where have I been? And when I was reading this book, I was like, oh, my God, a new cane. Oh, yeah, there, there was one that published in 2018 and then 2013 before that. And then I think 2012 before that. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, it, it's not as quick as it was, but it's... <laughs> Right. Like he's still, it's still fairly regular. It just it's been a while. I think actually since like since the rift. I don't know. I well, wasn't, I was be, not expecting one. That's always gonna be the interesting thing because you know if you look at a lot of the uh, timestamps of the earlier books, she mentions M four two, which is where which is when the rift happens. So I'm always gonna be curious, like with Caiaphas Kane, like. Are you going to have any stories about the rift? Because he does mention quite often about the Black Crusade, going, the 13th Crusade going on, which as I learned in my own research, like, wow, that thing took a long time. That was a very long crusade. Abaddon was really playing the long game or he was just mucking about for that long. I don't know. Actually, what it was is that the board, the tabletop campaign had to continue. So therefore, we, we, we got we to gotta take some time here. But so I'm always going to be interested in, in that. I don't think it'll ever happen where we actually have Kamas Arcane meet Reboot Gulliman because that would be awesome. I don't know that a book could handle that. Well, I know I couldn't handle that. I'd be squeeing off my couch, so. <laughs> Probably. Kind of like how I, I was when uh, Uriel Ventress, when he first met Reboot. It was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I like it. I think it's good. I do understand that, like, for, like on a meta-commentary purpose, you can have, like, they can go back and not really have anything that affects the current lore or necessarily, like, pushes that lore forward. Mm -hmm. They can just go back and be like, hey, here's a really cool story. And Caiaphas Kane is arguably the best sandbox in which to do that, right? Because, because as you how said, many 200 years. Hundred, not only that, but hundreds of thousands of battles go on across the galaxy all the time right that we don't hear about right exactly that um i he, and he again he's a great sandbox for this because you can do these stories they don't necessarily push the lore forward mm -hmm. they don't do anything like that they're just fun they're just fun they're just there to be popcorn there or if your favorite fast food to go to order um they just work and he is i make mention about the whole um i too was confused but it's like the don't ask there's just don't ask questions it does fit within the style he, he goes back and he adds new details and he adds new stories throughout right he did he was pretty careful in this book to not affect the caiaphas cane lore and the caiaphas cane mm -hmm. timeline um even though it is a little odd <laughs> that he has this very interesting interaction with the with the uh, Necrons. Oh, he has a very inter interesting interaction with everybody. Like, I don't, like, it's funny going back through this. I was like, did you ever really fight the Tau? Because it never seems like you actually did. <laughs> you always seem to work with them. Because, like, even for the greater good, they were fighting the Tau. And then the Tau was like, parlay, parlay. He's like, for why? Oh, crap. There's a high fleet on the way. And yeah, right. basically, basically the Tao was like, maybe we should put aside our differences to deal with this. And he's like, yes, let's. Then we can go back to killing each other. That's right. That's right. Exactly that. Um, because nobody 
Nobody wants any part of the Tyranids at all. Ever. I really want a Necron Tyranid book. That would be weird. Because I would imagine that the Tyranids would just be really frustrated. Like, so, no biomass. But, because you know what happens to the Crute, right? When they try to eat a piece of Necron? Does that happen with the, the Tyranids? Because that's interesting. Oh, that would be interesting, actually. Just saying. Actually, there's a few comments. Speaking of that, um, there were a few comments throughout the book when he's talking with uh, Asnabal, and he he kind of references. He's just like, well, gosh, nobody's ever had a conversation like this with the Necron. I was like, <laughs> sir, maybe maybe not to your knowledge, but somebody had a dinner party with them. <laughs> well, to bear th be fair, that was post rift. So <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, but some of the things he was saying, I just kept flashing back. That scene will forever be one of my top scenes in all of Warhammer 40k fiction. I mean, that, that um, is true. What I laughed at when he was talking about, you know, he didn't want his like torso to be worn across one. And Hamberly's like, some of my more dramatic colleagues call them the flayed ones. I'm like, yeah, it's, there's a reason for that. Like, I do like when she calls them dramatic. I'm like, but that's what they're called, dear. That's that's their name. <laughs> you uh I like the uh I like his like tongue in cheek commentary on the Warhammer 40k universe on the whole, but I also like this idea that the more dramatic colleagues are the ones that won out in the end. Right. Well, even when she's so, talking about, you know, the, when he's talking, when he's telling her about what Asnabal told him about the biotransference, which, you know, readers know about that. And he's like, is that true? And she was like, some of my colleagues have hypothesized that, but that appears to be true. We're like, oh, no, it is. It is. It is. Oh, we're going to talk a lot more about that in a minute. Um, first off, I have to ask, though, with the Reclaimers, because the Reclaimers are in this book. Are they effective? Did you like them? Did they serve the narrative? Yeah. Did you I, understand why they were there? I did. I did. I mean, it totally, it totally made sense for them to be there with, with the Mechanicus. Um, I was kind of hoping it'd be the last Reclaimers he served with. And maybe they had a great story about, oh, by the way, that uh, Space Hulk that they disappeared on, we found it. And they're all alive. And we all had cake. That was really kind of what I was... <laughs> The crew the have made cake. Yeah, the crew made cake. I was kind of hoping it was that, but it was, but it was still fun with with this new batch. And actually, I kind of liked Maury better. Oh, I loved Maury. God, especially at the end when uh, oh. Kane makes that comment about you know, you know, anything can be used can be used in the name of the emperor, including the enemy's ego. He's like, hmm, that's why we're not allowed to have one. It's like nice, nice. I liked his character in general. I like that he seems kind of bemused <laughs> by Kane. Yeah. And he kind of defers to him in a few places. And I almost get the impression it's because he's like, well, let's see where this goes. <laughs> like, I'm a space marine. I, I got the impression he was very comfortable in his status. <laughs> like, Oh, man. I, I meant, thought I meant to look this up. Do you know which, not which founding, I don't care about which number of founding, but like their Primarch. Because I'm going to guess it's the Iron Hands. The fact that they like... Yeah, I think they mentioned Just because of how much are. they like the Mechanicus. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Watch it be like the Iron Warriors or something. <laughs> so because this is Sandy Mitchell's chapter, essentially. Um, mm, quick, quick thing doesn't say... I would have to imagine, I would have sworn, maybe I just added that in as my own thing. Um, I would have to imagine they are of Iron Hand's descent. Because yeah. they just, they're just a little too fond of the Mechanicus. Right. And, um, oh, yeah. So, and Lexicanimates, similar to the Iron Hands. So I'm going to go ahead and guess. Because, yeah. it, I mean, it's Sandy Mitchell's chapter. So I'm going to guess that. They're the Iron Hand's light. Yes, not nearly as they don't. Uh, they don't get into the flesh as weak or. I was going to say insufferable as the Iron Hands, but I don't want to throw off any Iron Hands fans in here. Um, I don't personally 
resonate with the Iron Hands. I like the, the Iron Legion. Hands during the heresy. I don't like what they've right. become now. Yes. Which is I would agree light. with that. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Diet um, <laughs> Just one calorie. <laughs> um, I love... The Reclaimers are Mechanicus zero. <laughs> I like the Reclaimers. I think they're really fun. I... I thought in like kind of the middle stretch of the book, they were a little, I was kind of like, why are you guys here? Like there was a, they, they really were like, they felt more prominent and lore, like narrative specific in the beginning and then in the end. But in the middle, I was kind of like, oh, I guess, I mean, there's so much, like, there's not, I don't know how to explain what I'm trying to say here. My words are totally failing me tonight. Um, But I was like, I felt like I could have seen more, I guess because I liked Maury so much. I was like, can we have more time with him, please? I yeah, just like I mean, but also I understand that you really can't have a space marine sneaking around with you. Yeah, okay, that's fair. I mean, we if it was a raven it. guard, maybe. <laughs> but but not a reclaimer. True, true. They don't strike me as a subtle, stealthy group of people either. All right, yeah. let's dive into the meat of this, because I know you're going to have lots of opinions on this. And there's a lot to say here. Is the Adeptus Mechanicus really its own at worst enemy? Uh, yes. I mean... There you have the conk. I mean, you know, when Amberly Vale was even talking about... I think they're, like, because Jurgen doesn't like them, he finds them very weird. And even Amberly's like... Yeah. And even Amberly at one footnotes was just like, yeah, yeah, they're weird. Oh, she says, like, she's really surprised that the Ordo Hereticus hasn't come and checked them out yet. It's a very good point. I do like when she talks about how many people have tried, like how much effort has been thrown towards deciphering Baneric. Right. And zero progress has been made, essentially. Yeah, she's mentioned that actually in so many different books about how the Order Dialogus has tried. Yeah, so. I think that it's a thing that warrants repetition, though, because it is one of the things that is makes them their own worst enemy is they really are a faction apart from the Imperials. I mean, they have their own language. They have, and if you're not part of the cult mechanicus, you don't speak the language. Right. That is, they are a very secretive order. Which given how much the Imperium really counts on them for like everything, it's, um, yeah. And the other problem is, with them was like the whole Omnisci thing. And it's just, uh, you know, you have some that, you know, like I would do, like Vorsprung and um, I can't remember her name. But you can tell that they really do believe, you know, that the Emperor and the Omnisci are one. Mm-hmm. But you can also tell that um, Tesla does not believe that. Tesla yes. believes that the Omnissiah is the machine god, very distinct. And the machine god, most likely the same god of these Necrons, you know, is is is, is there to help them. Um, and so and I think the other problem with with the uh, Mechanicus actually goes even back to the Horus Heresy. You know, uh, in Graham McNeil's book, uh, Mechanicus, the fabricator general at that time was still angry that the emperor had locked away this vault, like to the point he even erased his memories. He couldn't remember like where, where it was because he wanted to know what was in this vault. He was still angry about that. And that had been hundreds of years, or actually thousands of years prior. And he was still upset mm-hmm. and upset about that. And they had talked about how their research, some of the research they were doing, even the ones that were not traitors, was kind of borderline heretical what they were doing, how they were experimenting on people and their souls and... Um, and then you have, you know, the ones that did the split and went into the, the dark scrap code and what they were doing, corrupting machine spirits and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have what happened in Vaults of Terra, right? You're making deals with, with the Drukhari. They're like, what's, what's the difference? And Space yeah. Elf is... An Eldari is an Eldari. Yeah, one Space it's Elf is same as every other Space Elf, like... And of course, we're smarter than them because we're the smartest beings of anywhere because the flesh is weak and therefore you can't trick us. Okay. You know, um, 
there, there's a lot. And I just think, you know, they're almost like their own little alpha legion. It just, you just don't know which, which side they're really on, even if they think that they are on the side of the emperor, but are they really, or is it they're on, mm-hmm. are they on the side of what they think the machine God is? Well, and I think it's interesting that similar to the ecclesiarchy, right? Oh my God, 100%. <laughs> they really are just a reflection of the ecclesiarchy in that they have these, I don't want to say false prophets, but you know what I'm going for yes. here. Well, those that claim that they know the will of the omniscient. They know the will. And they are they are very misguided. And I would say they are equally misguided as to some of the characters that we have seen in other books uh, with the ecclesiarchy, right? They're they're exactly. constantly looking for these answers, and I think it goes back to I know to, that I have I know what the emperor wants. Oh, I'm sorry. How to me, it's the same thing as anyone from present day saying that you know I know God's plan. Oh, that's cute. I'm so glad right. that you, you talk to him like that. You are that special to know to know God's plan. Never mind the fact that it strictly states in the Bible that nobody knows God's plan. But you do. That's cool. That's cool. It's the same thing like the Ecclesiarchy, same thing with the Mechanicus. Whenever you get him, it's like, well, I know whatever's will. Okay. Do you, though? Even with the Chaos Gods, I know what Corn wants. Do you? Do you? Do you really? <laughs> Looking right over at the word bearers. Um, I, I think well, one I'm of the things like, that are... I'm thinking of Ur- Urkanthos, right? He knows what Corn wants. No, that's actually not really what Corn wanted. <laughs> right. Very much so. I was thinking more of, um, I, I keep going back to Armageddon with this into this idea that Erebus and Corferon are in a Mexican standoff trying to see who's going to cross that river first and start a war um, because they both know what the gods want. And it's not what the other person thinks. Um, they Corferon's um, always thought that. To be fair. It reminded me a little bit, because one of the things that you and I have talked about uh, throughout this year is that there's this kind of under, undercurrent, recurring theme about desperation in the Imperium, right? And I'm thinking specifically of Longshot with the Tau mm-hmm. and their propaganda and how we get to see, like, yeah, people are desperate and they do, they make questionable decisions out of their desperation, Right. I feel as though the Mechanicus, there's a little undercurrent of that, right? Like in the Vaults of Terra series, the Mechanicus is desperate because they don't know how to fix the throne. They right. recognize there's a problem, but they don't know how to fix it. So they're desperate, right? This book felt more like, well, our current way of doing things is not really sustainable. So we're going to believe exactly what this guy tells us. And my favorite thing is about this whole thing is that in the initial meeting between Cain and and Anzibal, he's like, are you actually going to do this biotransference thing? And Anzibal's like, oh, no. But then he even <laughs> says, he's like, we can't do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, he's like, e- even if we would allow you to, we can't. <laughs> wow, that wasn't hard to drag out. Like, I feel like if any of the mechanics, like, I had to wonder, did anybody on the Mechanicus ask, oh, for real? Maybe there's that good at lying. Oh, totally. Totally we will. But it just, it feels like a combination of hubris and des- and desperation. Well, and even... By God, is hubris a thing? Well, even a- Asnabal was full of hubris and desperation, right? Oh, my God. Apparently he has some rival dynasty out there that he's just like, I'm going to take care of this and you're going to see how my dynasty is mighty. Sorry for the British pronunciation there. Uh, my dynasty is mighty. And, uh, you know, and when, because Cain, he's like, yeah, I've been to a tomb. Oh, really? It wasn't as great as this. Like, have you seen my stuff? <laughs> Behold, my, my stuff. stuff. Exactly. That's really what I thought when he, Pretty much. When he did that. Was it as nice as this? And, you know, like the hubris, Carlton. hubris of like, well, where is this place? Can you show me? You know, just. Well, I liked who. Let's, we'll, we'll kind of bridge these two questions here because with Asnabal, the politics of the Necrons. Mm-hmm. Um, Which is kind of entertaining to me in many, many ways. Just how put out they get about other dynasties. It cracks me up. 
how put out they get about everything. Other dynasties, other races, like everything for them is just... And like, I know we said this before when we read um, Fallen... Fallen King, The Lost King, the, that that two Necron series that we read. Oh, um, um, Ruin and Rain, right? Like Yes, thank you. Rain and Ruin. Twice Dead um, King, that's what it is. Yes, thank you. Y'all, the words just aren't coming tonight. Um, we read those books, and there was another Necron book that we had read, too. Actually, it might have just been um, Get You Some Chartreuse. Um mm. Their petty politics, their bored aristocracy is essentially what they are. And it's interesting to me that the Adeptus Mechanicus, like Cain, and I understand that it's kind of played for laughs and it's kind of played because Cain is way smarter than he plays to be. But it's interesting. <laughs> they fall for bored rich people schemes, basically. Mm -hmm. Like Asnabal is the Sam Bankman freed of the world <laughs> free, the universe, if you will. Um, <laughs> too soon no, um, no 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 <laughs> literally never <laughs> um, the Elizabeth Holmes mm. if you will um, could go on for days um, but like the fact that they fall for this but I guess it's because of desperation or hubris that they're just like oh we like what they're saying so this is exactly what, what we want we want to be like them well, I love the idea that Kane is like, wait a minute, you guys actually were mortal at some point? And the guy's like, yeah, but we weren't the ones who did this to ourselves. And I like how he explains it. It's like the ones who did this are now slaves to us. And Kane's yeah. like, okay. He's like, I didn't understand it, but I was just going to play along. I was like, exactly. Yeah. Okay, sure. He's like, they're shards. Like we split them into shards and they're now slaves to us. I was like, yeah, keep telling yourself that, friend. <laughs> okay. Can I can I give you my one wild theory on this, by the way? Sure. There was a little bit of time there. I know this didn't come to pass, but there was a little bit of time, really, when he was talking with Hasnabal, that I was like, is Tesla, is he a shard of the Deceiver? He was giving, it was giving Deceiver, as the kids would say. Um, but I think the other reason that I ask if the Mechanicus are their own worst enemy is, why is Cain sent here to begin with? Because it ain't producing and it ain't getting off the ground. And the Mechanicus, it's like, layers. It's fine. It's fine. It's just a little it's delay. Fine. It's fine. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, please. Just don't worry about it. Like, they know that something's wrong, but they don't want anyone else to know. Exactly. And just the layers, the layers of obfuscation that well, Kane runs into. Hell, remember uh, Storm of Iron? You, I'm sorry, you mean one of my all-time favorite books? Yes, I do remember well, that one, actually. Well, just the fact that they were poisoning everybody? Oh, keep their yeah. precious secret a secret? I mean... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. They, this idea that they are really... Their secretive nature, it's almost cult-like. Well, yes, that's, that's why they call the cult of Mechanicus. Yeah, Jinx. I said that, and then I was like, no. Nah. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean, though? Yep. It literally is cultish. And um, and um, apologies, my family just got home from hockey practice. Um, so they like it is cult like this idea of like we don't talk outside of the circle and we don't let anybody else know what's going on and we don't tell people this and we don't tell people that and well, you how, can't know and even within their own cult, how jealously like, they guard their own research. Right? Oh my god, yes, and. It, <laughs> it kind of reminds me of both the Ecclesiarchy crossed with the Inquisition. Like, they took the worst parts of the Ecclesiarchy and the worst parts of the Inquisition and were like, we like all of this. <laughs> Just package it up. The fact that they are constantly fiddling with things they shouldn't be fiddling with, and they know it too, to be clear. They know they shouldn't be fiddling with these things. Well, the, but always, the first book of we know what Imperium, we're doing. Right? Run, reboot. Came yeah. in and he was just like, no, you can't have this. It's forbidden. And they were like throwing a fit. He's like, what happened that you don't know you can't have, you know, Xenos tech? And, you know, it's something like even Caiaphas Kane was nervous at the end. He was like, how am I going to convince Vorsprung and uh, Norvad to 
destroy all this this Necron tech. Well, it turned out it wasn't very hard because even they recognize Xenotech is not good tech. But how many other right. how many other Mechanicus though? Like look at uh, what happened on Simia or Calque in uh, Caves of Ice. They're like, oh my god, this is all ours, right? And he, he's like, no, we must bury this. We we have to go. And they're like, no, it's Archaeotech. We need this. And I think it goes back to you know one thing they talk about in the Horus Heresy was that the age of technology and enlightenment is gone. So there's so much knowledge. And then at the you know and in the book Mechanicus, when the uh, Dark Mechanicus has officially taken over. What happens to all those um, those big forge? I forget what they were called. The big forges that were there, they blew them up because mm -hmm. they couldn't let the Dark Mechanicus get a hold of their research. So all of that has been lost. So there's just such this desperation to get back what they lost. They don't even think about what they're doing. You know, it's like right. the pivotal line in Jurassic Park. They don't. Even, just because you could doesn't mean that you should. Right. And I think there's this... I think there's this... This desperation also to, like... It's this weird dichotomy of... Well, new tech is bad. Xenotech is bad. But we also recognize that we've kind of stagnated. And we need to progress. And so we're going to go after this technology. And who but decided that new tech is bad? That's the thing that always baffles me. Because... Again, it both going, is and isn't. Both going back to the Horus Heresy, they were constantly doing research for new technology to improve upon what they already had. So it's such an interesting you know, now where they're like, you know, nobody's allowed to think. No, you can't make new technology. That's heretical. But why? Right. Well, and it's because someone had a bad experience. It, it's this weird. It, it's always the weird thing about the Mechanicus, right? And at the end of the day, like in this case, you knew what you're doing was wrong because you were trying to hide it. Right. And like like when Tesla is giving this whole speech about how like, look, we're going to save everyone and we're going to make this. This is going to be the grand new step and this is going to be so good for us. Then why are you trying to hide it so bad, friend? Right. Oh, it's because you know it's wrong and you know it's bad. And part of, that's the other reason why I was like, shard of the deceiver? Not on the level. Um. Not quite the way that I was thinking. And I kind of accidentally did like a Trump impression there. Um, they, it's, it's the best tech. I've asked everyone I know. It's the best tech. It is the best tech. Uh, the Necrons yeah, do have the to best be tech. To be fair, the Necrons, they do have cool tech. I did, uh, moving into our other question about uh, Asnabal, whether or not he was an effective villain. I, it's hard to downright call him a villain, although technically he was. Um, he's just a bored aristocrat. And he recognized an opportunity with the Mechanicus. I loved his reasoning for why he just didn't, you know, take over. He's like, well, but if I did that, then we couldn't fight off the might of the Imperium. So we're just going to have them help us build our, you know, our Death Star. And then we'll take over because it was a Death Star. It was it was completely and totally a Death Star. Make no mistake about it. When he started describing it, I was like, that's a... Deaths. That's no moon. Yes, I was um, waiting for, the, for him. When he popped up the hololith, I was really hoping he would say, that's no moon. Right? <laughs> Missed opportunity yes. there, Mr. Mitchell. Missed opportunity. Um, I mean, you've, my husband's you've made reading. Star Wars references in other books. You know, I totally. Well this one. My husband's reading some new science fiction series, and he's, like, in book two or three, and he said, then, like, in the middle of the book, all of a sudden, two guys are like, gentlemen, gentlemen, we can't fight in here. This is the battle room. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. So you, can throw in, you can throw in movie references all over the place. That's all time one of the all-time greatest quotes from any movie, um, which I absolutely love. But that's no moon. Like, you could have said so many things. So many things about it being a Death Star. Literally a Death Star. Um, <laughs> the idea that we need the, I, that had to hurt. We need the deliveries. <laughs> we need, we need you primitive monkeys. We need you. That had to hurt. Yeah. Which is always interesting to me because especially just having read Gene Father, the idea that the Mechanicus can get an upper hand on the Necrons. 
It's a little interesting. Do you mean Fall Acadia? Mm, no, I mean Gene Father that we read. Okay. Two books I guess ago, I don't three remember. Ago. Was Trazen in that? I don't remember him. Uh, no, 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 no. The um, God, I can't remember her name. The the Necron that uh, Call had like imprisoned. Oh, and she was just like, oh, you're so stupid. And he's like, oh, I noticed that you're not fighting me right now. And she's like, <laughs> exact That's noise she made. Totally forgot about her. Which oh my funny, god, I, I loved her. I was thinking about that earlier today because I was thinking like you know when uh, uh, Fabulous Spell distracted him. And he was just like, there's nothing you can do. And he was like, really? I know about something you have on your ship. And then she's like, I told you I would get you. I Every time when I read that, every time I think about that scene, all I could think is like, he would, he should have said, oh, balls. Because that would have been the perfect response to that. It Even though he been. probably doesn't have any. I'll be really honest. I've never given it any consideration and I really don't want to. <laughs> 10,000 years old. Um, oh, so there's... They don't exist. No, those those got removed with everything else. Pro probably, or just like, anyways. Or they've gone back <laughs> in. Who knows? But I just yeah, the hand think, gesture really helped. I think. <laughs> I just <laughs> well, I had to help it for our listeners, but um, I just that's my first thing. Is like when that happened, I was like, <laughs> oh balls, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. Um, oh dear. Not exactly what I had expected. Um. I like this idea. It, it's a, it's an interesting thing with the Necrons. Again, they, I know I could reference Grey Gardens, but that's what these people remind me of. Like, oh my God, we were so fabulous once. You're not anymore. There's raccoons living in your attic right now. <laughs> and yes, the raccoons are the Adeptus Mechanicus. Um, I oh, did I like call them. them the Eldar, but that works too. <laughs> There's that too. Um, I did I loved that first scene when he and Caiaphas just sit down and talk. It is, again, it reminded me so much of that scene in Kazarkin. I, really, I don't know why, but for some reason that, mm, that hits me somewhere in the heart with this concept of just having a civilized conversation with your enemy, with your adversary. He's like, there's because, no point in killing you because what are you going to do? <laughs> and I know you and I talked about it before the podcast, but when Caiaphas Kane shoots him and he's just like, Really? Like, did this just happen? Yes, it did just happen. And honestly, how the narrator, Stephen Pairing, how he changed his voice into into that, how he delivered it was just chef's kiss. Mm. Really? We're going to talk, talk a lot more about that in a sec because it actually bears, it bears discussion point at this point. Um, but I really do like a good, sophisticated villain off. Let's just talk. I liked to imagine them figuratively swirling brandy. Um, but it no, did, it did call it back. There was definitely some going on there. A little Amasek there just in their mm -hmm. sniffers swirling it around as they discuss. And again, I did just, I liked how straightforward he was with Kane immediately. No need to lie. Nothing of that. Are you really going to biotransference them? No. Oh, oh. <laughs> like, we would never give you the honor. We can't anyways. Well, I think that's, I think he didn't like him because he, there's nothing he needed from him. Exactly. But he could have just been like, oh, totally. But no, he just, like, I don't need you. I have nothing to say for, about you. So there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about this really quickly because I feel like it does need talking. Uh, we both listened to the audio version. You convinced me. And there was maybe another reason. Um, the, the physical version of Vainglorious cannot be located at this household. Um, but you convinced me to listen to the audio versions of Caius Fiskane. Why are they so good? Because Stephen Pairing is Caius Fiskane. Like, that's just the way it is. I love his Caius Fiskane. I love his Jurgen. He does an, um, his Jurgen is perfect. Um, I love uh, Penelope Rollins, who they have for Amberly Vale. She's amazing. I was he is awesome. I was disappointed that this didn't have the five ninety seventh because I really wanted Jen to listen to the woman who does the ex the excerpts from Janet Sula because she does an mm -hmm. amazing, amazing job with them. But I love the uh, other narrators they get in to read the other part, especially like I now have an emotional attachment to Andrew James Spooner. Because anytime I hear that Clothier is going to provide some text, I'm like, oh, good. 
is Andrew James Spooner is here. He's like an old friend at this point, as much as I've listened to them. Like I've gone back to listen, even the books I've already read, like the first three books that we read, I've gone back to listen to them because it's such a well done production. And my first time it, listening that's to That's the Stephen, best word for it. Like the first time listening to Stephen Pairing was in a Horace Heresy novel and I didn't really like it very much and then when i heard he was doing this i was like oh my god i didn't like him in the horus heresy and oh my god no he is caiaphas cain 100 percent. and that's but even when i'm if i'm actually reading the book i hear jurgen how he does jurgen i hear him doing caiaphas cain when i read the footnotes i hear penelope rollins i will say i loved i kind of I low key want to go back and listen to the Regent Shadow because apparently she does the female characters in that. Oh, okay. And I would absolutely love that. Um, but I, it's not just her voice and how imperious she sounds. There's this casually haughty arrogance to her voice, the way that mm -hmm. she plays it, the way that she says it. She also. <laughs> She also apparently narrates like romance novels and like historical romance novels, which is if you've listened to this podcast for any amount of time, you know that I have that secretly way up my alley. I might have, they're not Westerns, so meh, but that would actually be even more humorous. Anyways, I might have to go and check a couple of those out <laughs> because her voice is delightful, but it's the way that they handle the footnotes. Because that was the part that I was like, how are they going to handle the footnotes? Because Amberly's footnotes, typically when I'm reading... I'll sometimes I'll just wait till I get to the bottom of the page, but you know, you read and then you see, oh, there's a footnote. Okay. Then you come back up the way that they interject them in. And because it's a separate voice, because it's her, it works so well. As you said, when he's just like, and who doesn't trust the Adeptus Astartes or Arbertes? And then at the bottom, she's just like, huh? yeah. it feels so natural. And it, it, I think you, the best word that you used for it was it is, it's a production at this point. It's almost like an audio drama. Almost. Like, I would recommend, if you're not going to listen to it, but if you're going to listen to one, I can't recommend listening to, to Kane's Last Stand enough. Again, that's not one with the 597, so it doesn't have Janet Sula, but the production that they do for that one is so, so well done. And Stephen Pairing actually makes his voice sound a little older, so it is like Caiaphas is in his older years. It's He's amazing. He is honestly amazing. I even listened to the, all the short stories. And so there's the two short stories in that anthology that are told from Jurgen's point of view. And so with him doing the Jurgen voice the entire time is just awesome. 100% awesome. It actually awesome. makes those stories even funnier listening to him him do it, do it in that voice. Um, I kind of wish almost in a way that Amberly Vale's... Uh, entire crew was with this because you got to hear how he does uh her savant mott's voice because he gives him kind of a little lisp and he's just so special and he <laughs> but he kind of talks the way that you would kind of imagine that to be and uh i think it was in the it's in the fifth book where he's on Perumbia and he's got the governor's daughter like basically following him around who thinks uh -huh. she thinks she's a soldier but she's really really not he gives her this awful lisp and it works because it just kind of highlights like how much she doesn't really know what she's talking about. It's so great. Like, so um, as for someone who never really cared about doing audiobooks, like I cannot, cannot recommend the Caiaphas Kane books and audio enough because they are. I am. I am not a big audiobook person, but you have definitely converted me for the Caiaphas Kane ones. I and mean, there's inevitably a sequel. Um, well, I will definitely there listen is, to it. There is going to be because we got to hear about the death. He's on the Death Watch. It's so much fun. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm so excited, you guys. I absolutely. Again, I liked it. I didn't love it. It's not my favorite. But it was definitely fun. It's not my favorite, but it's fun. It's Caiaphas Kane. And guys, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my audio people, but this cover this cover the cover so is beautiful. fantastic. I love I love all the details in it. I definitely love Jurgen. Um, it, they just did a really good job with it, and it's See? a fun story. I like the idea. It's interesting to me whenever anybody in the Imperium discovers. Um, yeah, there's a little bit more to the Necrons than you think there is. <laughs> Like and the Mechanicus, and I love the Mechanicus. I think everyone knows I love the Mechanicus, and even I like I'm just. 
as soon as it, the whole like plot starts unspooling, I'm like, oh, you guys with your bullshit. Oh, so how did you? I like, love you. How did you like in the audiobook when you got to the editorial note that was written by the Mechanicus? How they modulated the voice. That was impressive. That was that was impressive. fun. Yeah, it was good. Again, it's a production. So I think I've I've mentioned before that one of my favorite things is when the Black Library actually puts out the audio drama. So like the Baggett and Claude ones are great, and oh there's gosh, a couple yes. of. Oh my god, they're so good. But there's also a couple of horror audio dramas that are fantastic. I cannot recommend them enough to. Um, they're just good and they're well done. This one definitely actually I have a poster for Perdition's Flame that I have to put up somewhere because that's a great audio drama too. Um, but I really do like it. and especially because uh, Fall of Cadia, I, I tried because it's such a beefy book and we we're traveling back and forth for hockey practices. I was like, I'm going to listen to the audio book. It was so bad. It was so bad that I had to get online to see if I was just tripping. And sure enough, it is infamously bad. And we had people in the comments of that episode talk about how absolutely terrible it was. Mm. Coming off of that, this has restored my faith in humanity. So good. We'll only listen to Kai Kaya Kane audiobooks going forward. Was that kind of long rambly? It was, but at the same time, again, we're not audiobook people. And these are great. And if you've ever been curious, how does Kaya Kane and Jurgen sound? I'm serious. This is how they sound. It is perfect. They're perfect. I liked that. The other thing I will say... One of the things that kind of irks me about Caiaphas Kane, and every time it happens, it, I'm just like, okay, is the number of times he uses a variation of the phrase, if I had known oh, I know. how dangerous this planet was going to be, yeah. how bad this tunnel was going to be, how at bad following point, the sky was going to be. At this point, though, with listening to those, all the audiobooks that I have, I kind of am waiting for it. And I think that's such a fun tick of... How, you know, he's not a good writer, right? So to me, it's kind of a fun tick. And also, the other tick he also puts in there is how Jurgen will make some comment about basically they're all going to die. But he said it in a way that was like he was just commenting on the weather. It's always I, like he's commenting on the weather. And it's kind of like when I get to that point, you know, it's like Star Wars when you're like, I got a bad feeling about this. It's time to take a drink. It's just one of those things, and I think it's such a telltale sign of he doesn't know how else to write. And I don't think that means Sandy Mitchell's a bad writer at all. I think that's just one thing he just has Kane do. Right. And it does fit within his character, for sure. Mm -hmm. But it does irk me. It didn't irk me as much in the audio drama because it did kind of feel like the way, just the way that he said it. Just the way he, I can't, I can't again, I can't word this. The way that he voices Caiaphas Cain makes it do sound so conversational and natural. Yeah. Like, it's not a guy reading this character. It's just no. the guy. Re it's just Caiaphas Cain reading you a, his memoir. Like, I, I really have felt like I'm sitting there listening to Caiaphas Cain tell his story. I, I totally understand that now. And yes, I am now an audiobook conversion convert for Caiaphas Cain. Caiaphas Cain books. Yeah. Very excited about them. Unfortunately, there's no audio for this next one. There's no audio for this next one, but it is our tradition, and it is kind of a short one. Yep. We are reading Dagabo Rides again by Rory James. I'm assuming it's Rory. It's actually Ruri. I looked it up. Ruri. Okay, yes, there we it's go. It's Gaelic. Aha. Uh -huh. So there you go. You darn I, Scots. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I would have gone Rory, but Ruri totally yeah. makes more sense. No, I had Ruri no idea. James. I had no idea how to pronounce this. So I did a quick looking look up and it's and and they're like Ruri. It's like and so someone actually wrote like Perfect. Rory. They're like, "No, Ruri." I'm like, "Thanks." Okay. All right. So, well, Ruri this is my James American. Is. Yeah, so the Dagabo rides again. It's not it's now this is going to be a third year in a row where we end with a Red Gabo story and I'm very excited uh for a few reasons. One, it's short. Speaking of, speaking of good covers. That is a really cute cover. The cover is amazing with that squig on the front. Mm -hmm. I'm a sucker for the squig. Um, they're just adorable. And I've become, it's just, it's, it's just tradition now. Um, I'm and glad also, it's a tradition. I hope this new continues. Author. Yes. New author. New author. I think he's written like one other short story, which I've never 
red. I think I saw that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Well, it doesn't say. Oh, he wrote some of its parts, so that sounds like a Mechanicus book. Probably. A short story. But yeah, so, all right, Ruri. We will give this a shot. We're looking forward to it. Very excited. So we will be back actually in a week. We will be. And then. And then a week after after that. that. Award show. Awards. Um, God, this one's going to be hard. I feel like every single book we read this year, or at least the last, like there were like three or four in a row where we were like, oh, this might be my book of the year. Yeah. (laughs) Between Longshot. um, Rose and Darkness. the Rose in Darkness, and then Creed, uh, Ashes of Cadia. Creed, Ashes of Cadia. I was like, it's not Fall of Cadia. Ashes of Cadia. So good. No, I know oh, a good. bunch of listeners out there, they all say that Fall of Cadia is the book of the year, and maybe for you. Just remember, like, these are our books of the year, and we're just a podcast here's doing this for fun. You know, it's kind of like whose line sure. is in any way. The points don't matter. <laughs> It's just like our opinion, man. It's just like your opinion, man. You right? Remember that my life philosophy, my soul life philosophy was pretty much defined by the dude. Um, that's just like your opinion, man. Uh, Leviathan. Leviathan. Oh, God, Leviathan. I keep forgetting about Leviathan. Like, no, that one was really, 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 really good. The Lion, Son of the Four. Like, a lot of really good books came out this year. Do you know what? I'm going to go ahead and spoil things so really quickly. Do you know what's not going to be on my list? Any of the Dawn of Fire books. Oh, yeah, because two did release this year, right? Yeah. Yeah, Iron Kingdom, right? And Iron Kingdom and the The Martyr's Martyr's Tomb. Tomb. Yes. Can't even with that one. I can't even with either (laughs) of them. But we're just going to go on ahead and close out. You okay over there? I'm fine. I'm oh. just thinking about the Martyr's Tomb again, and there's just a little bit of PTSD. So you're having a little Vietnam flashback over there? <laughs> Look out for dead Fenrisians in the trees. <laughs> it's like, it's a, one of my favorite memes, like oh. how the Russians react when the trees start speaking Finnish. Oh my God. Dead you're Fenrisians right. in the trees. That's amazing. You're welcome. This is why she keeps me around, people. It's true. It's true. But you have listened to the Warhammer 40k book club episode regarding Vainglorious by Sandy Mitchell. Be sure to join us next time for Dagabo Rides Again by Ruri James. We are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast anywhere you get podcasts. Our site also has articles about our adventures in reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay a while and read from a crag. Get yourself a nice little bowl of Tana. Or Oolong, your closest thing to it. Yeah. Um, I got I got nothing tonight. I got, promise next week I'll be able to word better. Got no book. Got no Tana. Got no book. Got no Tana. I got nothing. Wife left me. Horse walked out on me. I don't know. Country song references. There are people dying in the city. <laughs> the city's on fire and people are dying. We're going to... I will be sure to... Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>